When most people think of a prairie, this is the sort of thing they think of open expansive areas with lots of grasses and blooming flowers. And this in fact is a prairie. This is the Natusa grasslands out near Dixon, Illinois. It's home for, to many rare plants and animals, including lots of rare butterflies. Hi, I'm Doug Tarrant, Chief Curator at the Chicago Academy of Sciences and its Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. And I'd like to talk about butterflies of the American prairie. I'd like to start by asking a question about prairies, like the one that we just saw. And in order to answer this question, I want to talk about the butterfly life cycle, because there's an important aspect of the butterfly life cycle that dictates where butterflies can and can't live. Then I'd like to do a, a brief tour of some of the major ecosystem types of northeastern Illinois and the butterflies that live there. And finally, I'd like to say a few words about butterfly conservation. This is not a prairie. This is Lincoln Park in Chicago, Illinois. It is North Pond right next to the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. And although this is a much more urban area than the Chusa grasslands that we saw a moment ago, it also is home to a whole bunch of butterfly species. Now, most of the butterflies that you can see in Lincoln Park can also be seen at the Nutrusa grasslands, but the reverse is not true. There are a whole bunch of butterfly species that you can find at a high quality remnant prairie like Nutrusa that you will not find in Lincoln Park. And so the question that I want to ask here is why would that be the case? Why are some butterfly species broadly adapted to the modern landscape that has been, been very altered by people and other butterfly species require these high quality natural area remnants. And so to do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the butterfly life cycle. Now, if you've seen the butterfly life cycle illustrated or demonstrated, uh, it is somewhat likely that you've seen it illustrated with the monarch. So I thought we'd do something a little different here and look at the butterfly life cycle using an endangered species. This is the swamp metal mark, and this is a butterfly that is confined to uh, a very rare type of wetland called a fen. Fens are uh, spring-fed wetlands, and the water in them tends to be alkaline. And this, this means that a lot of the plants and animals that live there are very specialized and often very rare species. So this is one of them. This is the swamp metal mark. Now, the adult is the reproductive phase of the butterfly life cycle. And so I have illustrated that by showing a mating pair of swamp metal marks here. Within a day or two after mating, the female butterfly will begin to lay eggs. And here is where the life cycle and the ecological requirements of butterflies meet up. Because much like with human people, butterflies are somewhat fussy eaters when they're young. Uh, adult butterflies can typically take nectar from a variety of type of plant species, but the caterpillars typically can only eat the leaves of a very narrow range of plants. And these plants that the caterpillars can eat are called the species host plants. This is swamp thistle. It is an uncommon thistle species that only grows in wetlands, typically in fens. And it is the host plant of swamp metal marks. Now the metal mark caterpillars do not eat the uh, beautiful pink flowers that you see here. The caterpillars feed on the rosettes. And you can see the thistle rosette here. Here's one of the leaves here. Here's one of the leaves here. And the caterpillars will actually eat from the underside of the leaves. In fact, the females will lay eggs on the underside of the swamp thistle leaves. These are uh, swamp metal mark eggs. They're tiny. They're about half the size of a sesame seed, maybe even a little smaller than that. And they're these very attractive dark pink flattened spheres. Now, when we talk about host plants, uh, I'll be talking about host plants repeatedly through the talk. If I'm, if I'm speaking about what a particular species of butterfly eats, unless I specifically say otherwise, I'm going to be talking about the host plant, the plants that the caterpillars feed on. 
So after anywhere from a couple of days to a few weeks, the egg hatches and a caterpillar comes out. Now, unlike people who have their bones on the inside, caterpillars have their skeletons on the outside. They have an exoskeleton. And because they have an exoskeleton, they're limited in how much that skeleton can expand as they grow. So what will happen is the caterpillar will eat and grow and eat and grow, and finally its exoskeleton won't be able to expand anymore. When that happens, the caterpillar will grow a new skin just under the surface of the exoskeleton, and then the exoskeleton will split open, and the caterpillar will be new, with the new skin will crawl out from the old exoskeleton. This process of molting or shedding its skin and crawling out in a roomier exoskeleton will happen anywhere from four to five times for most species of butterflies. And this phase of growth in the caterpillar is a phase of very, very rapid growth. If you think of a, a species like a monarch, and you think of the caterpillar that uh, might be um, an inch and a half, two inches long when it's mature, that caterpillar started in an egg that was also about the size of a sesame seed, and it reached its full growth within three to four weeks. That's an incredibly rapid growth rate. To put it in perspective, if a human baby were to grow at the same rate as a monarch butterfly caterpillar, a one month old baby would be the size of a school bus. So eventually the caterpillar has become full grown and now something a little different is about to happen. So, uh, Again, its old exoskeleton is, is uh, becoming no longer useful to it, and it grows a new skin under the exoskeleton. But this time, when the exoskeleton splits, it's not another caterpillar that comes out. And this structure, the pupa, or if it's a butterfly, it can also be called a chrysalis, will kind of wriggle out of the caterpillar's skin. And this is the phase of the butterfly's life cycle where metamorphosis is going to happen. Now, the pupa is, <clears throat> in many ways, the most misunderstood part of the butterfly's life cycle. Because metamorphosis is such a fascinating process, people like to think about this in terms of the chrysalis being a container or a little house or, or something like that, that some magical process is going on inside of that a butterfly is going to emerge from. But in fact, this is not a container. This is an insect. And if you look at it, you can see, here's the abdomen down here, and you can see the abdominal ridges here. Uh, these are the wing buds right here, wing pads, I should say, right here. Uh, this is the head up here. You can see the eye there. And the other thing that people believe uh, sometimes about the chrysalis is that the entire insides turn to liquid and the adult butterfly kind of magically emerges from this liquid. And, and that's not entirely right. Um, one of the things that's happening to the internal organisms of the organs of the chrysalis is that um, the larval organs are breaking down and that process does produce a lot of goo. And so the inside of the chrysalis does get kind of gooey and gloppy. But there are parts of the original structure that do not just turn to liquid. To the entire caterpillar phase of the butterfly's life, there have been little pads of cells called buds. And there are different types of buds. There are wing buds, there are leg bugs, there are um, antenna buds. And these here are, are little groups of cells that have been sitting quiet through the entire caterpillar phase. Here in the chrysalis, they spring to life and begin dividing and differentiating and growing into the adult structures. Eventually, the adult structures are fully grown in. The um, exoskeleton splits one final time and an adult butterfly crawls out to complete the life cycle. Now, as we go forward and uh, look at uh, our survey of ecosystems of Northeastern Illinois, I wanna talk about how the host plants 
drive where butterflies can and can't live. So let's go back to urban ecosystems. I, I mentioned earlier that there are a lot of butterflies that are well adapted to urban ecosystems. And you will find that butterflies of urban ecosystems have several things in common. They, uh, first of all, tend to be common species. Second of all, they use host plants that are either non-native weeds, native plants with the ecology of non-native weeds, uh, certain types of tree species, often trees that are planted for horticultural purposes, and in a few cases, agricultural plants. So here's a good example. This is the black swallowtail. It is one of the commonest butterflies in the Chicago area. We see them all the time on the grounds of the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. And these butterflies feed on members of the carrot family as caterpillars. Now on prairies, there are lots of nice members of the carrot family. There are plants like golden alexanders that are uh, avidly used by black swallowtails as host plants. But in urban areas, and uh, otherwise disturbed areas, there is a species of non-native plant that is used as a host plant, Queen Anne's lace, uh, which is a really abundant plant throughout northeastern Illinois. And this is the species of plant that is really more than any other keeping the black swallowtail uh, an abundant species in the modern landscape. A very similar story can be told for this little butterfly, the pearl crescent. And pearl crescents use a weedy native plant. The host plants of pearl crescents are various species of aster. And uh, these are native species of aster that it's using, but its preferred species of aster is hairy aster. And hairy aster, although a native species, has the ecology of a non-native weed. It grows in disturbed areas. It likes areas that don't have a lot of competition from other plants. You can find it in, um, uh, areas with sort of dry soil, uh, so places like the edges of bicycle paths, uh, railroad embankments, this sort of thing. And, and because those are common ecosystems uh, in northeastern Illinois, the aster remains a common plant species and the pearl crescent remains a very common butterfly. So everybody's favorite butterfly. I think the monarch sometimes uh, causes some confusion about host plants, because I've seen a number of cases where you'll see a, a, an article in a magazine about monarchs, and there'll be a beautiful picture of an adult monarch butterfly taking nectar on a milkweed flower, because milkweed flowers are really, really nice nectar sources. Lots of different butterfly species use them. But uh, you'll see a monarch on a milkweed flower, and the caption will say something like, monarchs can only eat milkweed. Well, that's true, but it's not true for the adult butterfly. Uh, this monarch, for example, is taking nectar on Joe pieweed, and you can see it's got its proboscis out here. It's actually uh, uh, got its tongue down there in the flower. It really is taking nectar. It is actually the caterpillars that uh, require milkweed. Here is the common milkweed. That's the plants that the caterpillars require, and uh, here is the adult uh, not adult, but the fully grown monarch caterpillar. And you can see the caterpillars are also very attractive with their uh, black, white, and yellow stripes. Uh, the monarch is well adapted to urban ecosystems because milkweed is well adapted to urban ecosystems. And uh, even though you've heard a lot I, uh, likely about the monarch being in trouble, it's actually still a fairly abundant and conspicuous butterfly in the North American landscape. And um, uh, it's very common for people to see monarchs in their backyards. Another big, beautiful butterfly is the tiger swallowtail. And this species <clears throat> feeds on trees. And one of the trees that the caterpillars really like is green ash. And that is a bit problematic for this butterfly in northeastern Illinois because a lot of the ash trees have been dying because of an invasive insect called the emerald ash borer. Fortunately, the tiger swallowtail is not entirely dependent on ash trees, and the caterpillars can feed on species like poplar and black cherry, and those species remain uh, abundant in the modern landscape. So the uh, tiger swallowtail 
uh, continues to do well. This is a really big butterfly. This actually is even a little bit bigger than the monarch. So if you see a really big black and yellow butterfly flying through your yard, uh, this is what it is. It's a tiger swallowtail. The Red Admiral is uh, the butterfly that I most associated with the really urban parts of Chicago. You will find this butterfly out in uh, high quality prairies and uh, in suburban gardens, but it's really most abundant uh, in my experience in the city. I will see it a lot in um, residential neighborhoods that have a lot of trees on their streets. Uh, we see tons of them on the grounds of the Nature Museum, but I've even seen them in the loop. Um, Chicago City Hall has um, a, a green roof on the roof of City Hall, and I have been up uh, on the green roof and seen red admirals using the flowers up there. So this is a very urban adapted butterfly. And this confused people for a while because um, the nettle family is the group of plants that the caterpillars can feed on. And stinging nettles, which are big conspicuous plants, and, and a lot of people have had um, uh, less than pleasant experiences with stinging nettles, but you don't find them in the city. And um, so people were wondering, what does the red admiral actually use? Well, it uses a member of the nettle family, but it's a non-stinging member. And it's a really little inconspicuous plant called pellitory. It doesn't grow much more than two or three inches high at the most. Uh, it's got really inconspicuous yellow-green flowers. Here it is growing right alongside of a bike path. It likes that kind of disturbed area. And it's just a plant that people don't notice very much, but it's very abundant in uh, sort of um, shadier uh, areas, uh, it particularly likes shady areas where there are sunny parts nearby, so parks are, are very good for this sort of plant. And this is the plant that is keeping the Red Admiral butterfly um, very abundant right in the city of Chicago. Now, there are a number of butterfly species that are associated with lawns. And of course, anything that's going to have an association with lawns is going to be likely to be an abundant butterfly because um, lawns are the largest crop that we grow in North America is lawn grass. And so this is a really, really abundant ecosystem. And the butterflies that are associated with lawns either live on the grass itself or on some of the weeds that will often grow in, in lawns. This is a buckeye butterfly and this lives on one of the weeds. Uh, this is the weed. This is a uh, round leaf plantain, and um, it probably looks familiar to it. If you haven't seen it growing in your lawn, perhaps you've seen it growing in somebody else's lawn. Uh, I rather like having this in my lawn because the butterflies like it, so we, we don't use um, uh, chemical treatments on my lawn in order to keep greater plant diversity for the butterflies. Um, Buckeyes are interesting in that they do not spend the winter here in Chicago in any of their life stages. Most species of butterflies have one life stage that they will uh, sort of crawl off someplace. It's often the caterpillar uh, and um, just sort of hunker down for the winter. Buckeyes don't. Um, they only survive in the deep south through the winter. And as you get into the spring months, as, as warmer weather starts moving its way north up the country, they will begin flying and breeding further and further north as the summer progresses. When I first moved to the Chicago area in the early 1980s, you didn't see that many buckeyes up here. And as the climate is warmed, this is one of the species that we are seeing both in greater numbers and with more and more regularity. Um, and it is now a very common and conspicuous and very beautiful butterfly of the Chicago area. Uh, this is the fiery skipper and it has a similar story. It does not re, uh, uh, survive the winters in the Chicago area. It breeds its way further north each spring. This has even more recently started being a more regular visitor to Chicago. It was really in the 1990s that um, more and more of these started showing up each year. Now this species lives on the lawn itself. The caterpillars feed on grasses and are very adapted to Kentucky bluegrass, which is the species of grass that most people's lawns are made up of. 
There are a number of butterfly species that feed on legumes and include clover as one of the legumes that they feed on. This is one of them. This is the clouded sulfur. These are the little yellow butterflies that you see very abundantly late in the summer, although they'll fly for most of the growing season. These will be um, one of the earliest butterflies to start showing up in the spring, uh, but they really increase in numbers as the summer progresses. And they uh, feed on a variety of um, legumes on prairies. They will use things like trefoils and similar legumes, but they really like uh, white and red clover, which makes them abundant on lawns. And they also like alfalfa, which makes them abundant in certain types of agricultural fields. Another butterfly that feeds on legumes is a tiny, tiny little butterfly. This is one of the most uh, smallest butterflies in the Chicago region. This is the eastern-tailed blue. And it's a gorgeous butterfly with those vivid, vivid blue wings. Can you imagine how pretty this butterfly would be if it were the size of a monarch? If you ever go to South America, there is a whole group of butterflies called the morphos. You can also see them in the Judea Stock Butterfly Haven at the Nature Museum. And they are bigger than monarchs, and they have wings that are even brighter and more iridescent blue than, than these. But eastern tail blues are our little blue butterfly, or one of our little blue butterflies, and they are really, really common throughout the Chicago area. Uh, skippers are one family of butterflies. They are the largest family of butterflies uh, that uh, live in Illinois. There are uh, over 40 species of skippers in Illinois. You can always tell that a butterfly is a skipper because they have these really wild hook-shaped antennae here. Uh, we'll go back to the eastern tail blue here. You, uh, oh, no, we won't. We'll go back one further. You can see most butterflies, their antenna ends in a little club here. Moth antennae just end in filaments. They don't thicken at the end. Skipper antennae end in this little hook-shaped affair here. This is a silver-spotted skipper here. It's named for this very conspicuous large silvery spot on the underside of the hind wing. They eat legumes uh, in a prairie. They really, really like tick trefoils, which is a type of legume. They will eat clover. They also really like an invasive tree species called black locust. So all of these things uh, make silver spotted skippers remain a very abundant butterfly on um, urban ecosystems in northeastern Illinois. I've mentioned non-native host species a number of times. Are there any non-native butterflies? Yes, there are, and they're all urban or urban-ish species. This is the most common of them. This is the cabbage white butterfly. These are the little white butterflies that you start seeing in the earliest days of spring. They will fly till the latest days in the fall. Uh, they have multiple generations each year. And as their name implies, they feed on members of the cabbage family. And so because they are agricultural pests, they have remained very abundant. And you may well have seen the caterpillars. If you have ever eaten broccoli and found green worms in your broccoli, the worms that you're seeing are actually caterpillars of cabbage white butterflies. I, this is a, another skipper. This is the European skipper. And as its name implies, it is from Europe. Caterpillars feed on cool season pasture grasses, and uh, its preferred grass species is Timothy, which is a Eurasian grass that has been planted a lot for uh, pasture, pasture forage in, in uh, horse pastures, and those can be good places, uh, current and former horse pastures can be good places to see European skipper butterflies. And our final non-native species, despite its name, is the American copper. Um, it is called the American copper probably because it has been in this country for so long. It is thought to have arrived in North America uh, in very, very early colonial times. Uh, genetic analysis has shown that the North American populations are most closely allied to the Scandinavian populations, so that's probably where it came from. American coppers have no known native host plants. 
The only host plant known for this butterfly is a non-native plant called sheep sorrel. And you can see the, uh, the reddish parts of the flowering stalks here, and you can see the green parts down here. It was brought over to this uh, country to be a salad green. Uh, if you ever taste a little bit of the sheep sorrel foliage, it's got a very uh, pleasant, sharp sort of lemony flavor to it. So uh, that's why the host plant was brought over and that allowed the American hopper to thrive. And this is a very abundant butterfly uh, throughout much of Eastern North America. So now let's leave the urban ecosystems and start looking at prairies. And I'm going to go down the moisture gradient. We're going to start with dry prairies and get wetter and wetter. And dry prairies include things like this uh, glacial came, um, which is found uh, out near Elgin, Illinois. These are piles of very well-drained gravel that uh, the glacier deposited that have um, drought-adapted plants growing on them. There are also sand prairies throughout much of Illinois. You'll see a lot of them uh, in uh, river, ma uh, major river drainages, down, like down around Peoria, down along the Kankakee River, and along Lake Michigan, places like the Indiana Dunes or Illinois Beach State Park. And at the dunes of Illinois Beach State Park, there are two extremely rare butterflies that fly very briefly, very early in the spring. This is one of them. This is called the hoary elfin. And its only known population in Illinois is at Illinois Beach State Park. It is actually listed as an endangered species here in Illinois. There are a few old records of this butterfly um, from the Indiana dunes, but it hasn't been seen in, in that part of Indiana for over a century now. Well, the reason this butterfly is so restricted to dunes has to do with its host plant. Its host plant is a low mat forming shrub called bearberry. These are the flowers of bearberry and uh, they grow out in the uh, open dune areas at Illinois Beach State Park. And in Illinois, that is the only place where there is a large population of bearberry. And so not surprisingly, that is the only place that there is a population of hoary elephants. Now, our other early spring duneland butterfly is um, a species that is not quite as rare as the hoary elfin. This is the Olympia marble. These are just gorgeous little butterflies, bright white with bright greenish markings on the underside of the hind wings. You can see the sort of marbling pattern that gives it its name. And it's perched on its host plant here. Uh, Rockcress, Erebus lyrata, is the only host plant that it uses here in Illinois. Um, and these fly so early in the spring, they fly anywhere from late April to mid-May, that for much of their flight time, this is the only thing that is abundantly in bloom and available to provide nectar for them while they're flying. So um, this is a rare case of a butterfly where both the adult butterfly and the caterpillar depend on the same plant. Now, it's not quite as rare as the hoary elfin. It can also be found down in the Kankakee Sands areas, in sand prairies down around Peoria and along the Illinois River, and in sand prairies along the Mississippi. Uh, a butterfly that's kind of enigmatic, it likes drier areas, but um, kind of, it will appear for several years in a spot and then disappear for a long time and not be seen for many years afterwards, and then abruptly show up in the same place. This is the Gorgon Checker Spot. This one was photographed along a uh, dry railroad prairie down in Gardner, Illinois, and they like members of the Aster family that have sort of thick sandpapery leaves. Um, so it's seen here on purple coneflower, those purple uh, flowers that we were seeing in the picture of the hill prairie. And that's one of its preferred host plants. It also likes a plant called stiff sunflower. Um, I have not seen this butterfly in Illinois for several years, but I fully expect that it will come back sometime within the next um, decade or so, and then probably disappear again just as mysteriously. This is a really rare butterfly. This is the dusted skipper. It gets its name from the sort of dusting that you see on the outer margins of the wings. It is known from only 
a handful of sites in Illinois. It can be found down in the Kankakee Sands area. It can be found over by the Mississippi River. There were a few more sites in Northwest Indiana, which is where this photograph was taken. Now, the interesting thing about some of these skippers that live in the various types of prairies is that they are much rarer than their host plants would imply. The caterpillars of dusted skippers can feed on a variety of grasses, including little blue stem. Little blue stem is far, far more abundant than the butterfly, and no one really knows why. It's obviously got some other factor that it needs that are that's only present on a small number of sites. And um, there are people working very hard in a number of places with a number of skipper species trying to find out what these factors are so that we can do better conservation of these species. Now we move down the moisture gradient to Mesic Prairie. Mesic Prairie is neither really wet nor really dry, but somewhere in the middle. Sometimes Mesic Prairies will be wet in the spring, but every year they'll dry out over the course of the summer. In other cases, they're just sort of in a middle le level of moisture the year round. There are a whole bunch of butterflies called fritillaries that live in mesic prairies, and they're all related to each other. Uh, they're very pretty, and most of them are rare. This is one of them. This is the silver bordered fritillary. It can be found in prairies that are on the wetter end of the mesic range. This is the Aphrodite frere. This is the Aphrodite fritillary. It can be found right in the whole mesic range of prairies, in, in those prairies that are very much in the middle on moisture. What fritillaries all have in common is that they caterpillars feed on violets. And it's really not well known why there is um, such a narrow range of places that the fritillaries can use the violets that they feed on. Uh, it's probably some combination of the species of violets that they are willing to use and the vegetative structure that they can thrive in. How shaded or open is it? How tall is the grass? That sort of thing. Now, the Aphrodite fritillary is very, very rare in Illinois. In fact, both of the Aphrodite and the silver bordered fritillary are faring poorly in Illinois in the last couple of decades. They both are at the southern edge of their range here in Illinois, and they may be responding badly here to a warming climate because both of these species remain abundant as you start getting north into Wisconsin and into southern um, Canada. Now, the Aphrodite looks a lot like another fritillary that's much more common in the Chicago area, the Great Spangled Fritillary. The Great Spangled Fritillary is a savanna species. You can tell them apart easily by the underside of the wings. This is an Aphrodite. This is the rare one. And you notice these two rows of silvery spots on the undersides of the wings. The area between those two rows is very narrow and fairly dark. The much more common Great Spangled Fritillary, the area between those two rows of silvery spots is much broader and a uniform light buff color. This is the rarest of the fritillaries in Illinois. This is the um, Regal Fritillary. And this is a really big butterfly. This is about the size of a monarch. These are incredibly beautiful butterflies. They are listed as a threatened species in Illinois. Uh, here is the underside. Um, the, um, uh, the upper side here was photographed uh, down in the Kankakee Sands area in Illinois. Uh, the underside here was photographed at Natrusa grasslands. Now, they tend to be a bit pickier about the violets that they will use. One of their preferred violets in northeastern Illinois is this one, arrow-leaved violet. Now, this butterfly actually, even though it's a rare species, has some good news associated with it. Um, in uh, just over the border from Kankakee in Indiana, there's been a lot of prairie restoration going on at the Kankakee Sands. And a native violet over there, an annual violet called Johnny Jump Up, has been really, really expanding and becoming much more abundant. Well, it turns out regal fritillaries can use Johnny Jump Ups, and their populations seem to be expanding over in the Kankakee Sands area. 
And one of the other nice things that we found about the regal fritillary is that they seem to be able to travel fairly long distances to establish new populations. So there's uh, an area that was being worked on that started developing the Johnny Jump Up Violets. And it was about 30 kilometers from the nearest known population of regal fritillaries. And after the violets became uh, abundant to a certain level, the fritillaries showed up on their own. So this is a species that there's at least some, some hopeful news regarding. Prairie skippers are, uh, as I mentioned before, not well understood in many regards. Uh, this is the Bysis skipper. It is known from only a couple of sites here in uh, northeastern Illinois. It gets slightly more abundant down in the southern tip of the state. But we do not even know what its host plant is up here. We know that the caterpillars eat some type of grass, but um, all of the literature says that they will use blue grama grass. Well, they've got to be doing, using something else up here in northern eastern Illinois because blue grama grass is a species from further south and west. We don't have it here. Butterflies of various types of wetlands. This is Bluff Spring Fen out near uh, Elgin, Illinois, one of, one of my favorite places in the whole world. Now, one of the things that people will often think about when they think about wetlands is willow trees, because willow like, willows like wet areas. And there are a couple of species of willows that are used by butterflies, or I should say a couple of species of butterflies that use willows. This is one of them. This is the Acadian hair streak, a beautiful little butterfly known from a number of wetlands with willows in northeastern Illinois. This one is interesting because it also really likes prairie willows. So uh, coming from the north northeast, I associated this with being a wetland species. But uh, here in northeastern Illinois, it can actually be most abundant on music prairies that have lots of prairie willow on them. So that's kind of an interesting twist on its usual story. And this butterfly also feeds on willow. Now, some people may be thinking, but that's a monarch. Monarchs feed on milkweed. Um, monarchs do feed on milkweed, but this is not a monarch. This is a monarch lookalike called the viceroy. And viceroy caterpillars feed on willows. And a lot of people have trouble telling monarchs and viceroys apart. Now, there's one really bomb-proof way to tell a monarch from a viceroy, and that is that line right there. You can see that the line is present on the viceroy and absent on the monarch. And with practice, you can even see whether the line is there or not as the butterfly is flying by. Now, one of the things that people often say is, yes, but the viceroy is smaller than the monarch. And on average, that is true. And most of the time, it is true. But there is overlap. The largest viceroys are going to be the same size as the smallest monarchs. So size is not a completely bomb-proof way of telling the two species apart. Uh, but the line is an excellent way of uh, telling whether you're seeing a monarch or a viceroy. This beautiful creature is uh, the Baltimore checker spot, a butterfly that we're doing some conservation work with uh, at the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum, and I'll say more about that in a moment. It's, uh, the female butterflies will only lay eggs on turtle head, this plant right here. And turtle head is an uncommon fen plant, and so in uh, Illinois, Baltimore checker spots remain an uncommon fen butterfly. I mentioned the swamp metal mark before. This is another butterfly that we are doing conservation work with at the Nature Museum. And uh, it is currently no longer found in Illinois. We are trying to bring it back to Bluff Spring Fen, which is the last known place that the species flew in Northeastern Illinois. It was seen there until the late 1930s. And the site has received a lot of love and a lot of ecological restoration since then, and we're hoping to bring this butterfly back. Uh, wetlands will often look like they're just covered in grasses, and a lot of the times the plants that look like grasses are actually a similar but distinct plant family called the sedges. And there are a number of butterflies whose caterpillars feed on sedges. This is one of them. This is the eyed brown. 
And uh, this butterfly is a very typical species of sedge meadows in northeastern Illinois. This is the black dash, a skipper that feeds on sedges. And this is the two-spotted skipper, another skipper that feeds on sedges. This uh, two-spotted skipper, I think, is the worst named butterfly in North America because the spots can only be seen when the butterfly opens its wings. And actually, uh, depending on how it's holding its wings, there will really be three or even four of them. And its name doesn't mention its easiest characteristic to identify, which is this long line, uh, bright white line that runs along this edge of the hind wing an uncommon skipper from wet prairies in Illinois. Our final ecosystem type is uh, savannas. This is Gibson Woods in uh, Northwest Indiana. And the blue flowers that you see there are wild bluefin. And they are the host plant of the butterfly that has one of the more unfortunate stories here in Illinois. This is the Carner Blue. Uh, Carner Blues feed on, uh, the caterpillars feed on lupin. And Carner Blues overwinter is an egg. And in 2012, something terrible happened. In 2012, we had a heat wave in March. And for about a week and a half in mid-March, uh, it was in the mid-80s over much of the Chicago metropolitan area, including all of the Carner Blue sites in Northwest Indiana. And what appears to have happened is that the eggs hatched, but that the warm weather was not uh, enough to cause the lupin to break bud. And so the caterpillars are, were around, their host plants were still dormant, and the caterpillars starved to death. Um, despite intensive searching, in 2013, only two adult Carner Blues were found, and those are the last two Carner Blues that were seen in Indiana. Uh, a very sad story and an illustration of ways in which changing climate can uh, really be hard on uh, various species, uh, including certain types of butterflies. Uh, another blue butterfly uh, that uh, we are on its southern tip of its range that has been struggling a bit is the silvery blue. You can see where it gets its name. Look at how silvery the blue on the hind wings is there. Uh, this particular picture was taken in Maine. Um, this picture is the only picture in the talk that was not taken by me. This picture was taken by Dr. Ron Panzer. This is a caterpillar of the silvery blue, and it is on um, one of the few plants that um, the silvery blue uses as a host plant, veiny pea. Now, I had thought until about a year ago that this species uh, had gone extinct in Illinois and Indiana. It used to fly in both of these states, were on the southern edge of its range, thinking, oh, similar story to the Carner Blue. In 2018, this butterfly showed up in Northwest Indiana for the first time in a long time. So uh, we're continuing to keep an eye on that population and very, very hopeful that maybe we might even be able to begin doing some restoration work with this species. Some of the savanna butterflies remain pretty common. This is a good example. This is a butterfly called the question mark. Um, you, we see it on the grounds of the Nature Museum a lot. You can see uh, it gets its name from this marking on the underside of the hind wing that looks sort of like a question mark. And uh, the caterpillars feed on uh, a number of plants, including nettles and elm leaves. And so this somewhat broader host plant usage <coughs> has allowed this butterfly to remain a bit more common. Uh, a butterfly that has responded well to ecological restoration activities is um, the pearly eye. Uh, this is part of a group of butterflies called satyrs. This also lives in savannas and oak woodlands. The caterpillars feed on grasses. One of its favorite host plants is a grass called bottle brush grass, which has been used extensively in Savannah restoration in the Chicago metropolitan area. And the butterfly has responded and become more abundant in a number of sites that have uh, increased their bottle brush grass through seeding. 
And uh, the skipper that I will use to illustrate Savannah skippers is the Havamock skipper. It's a beautiful skipper that flies fairly early in the season from late May into, into mid-June. It's got that gorgeous, big, bright yellow patch that's kind of translucent. If you see one of these um, in the late afternoon and the sun is kind of on the horizon, the sun shining through the wings will look kind of like stained glass. This butterfly feeds on foul manna grass, which is a characteristic grass of savanna ecosystems. So that concludes our tour of the various ecosystem types and the butterflies that live there. I want to say just a few words about butterfly conservation at the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. This is our conservation lab at the height of summer where uh, you can see all of these cups on the shelves here. These all have caterpillars of rare butterflies that we are growing. And when they become adults, we are going to release the adults, the adults onto ecosystem restoration projects to start new populations of rare butterflies. The way we do it, uh, here are regal fritillaries is an example. We collect uh, female butterflies and we put them in these cages. We put leaves of the host plant in the cage with them. The presence of the host plant leaves stimulates the female butterflies to lay eggs. Um, fritillaries seem to like to lay their eggs on the netting on the top of the cages. You can see eggs over here on the top of this cage that the um, uh, fritillary has laid. We let the eggs hatch. We uh, raise the caterpillars up in those paper cup type cages. This is a um, uh, regal fritillary caterpillar. Um, very, very beautiful caterpillar. Most people don't see them because not only is it a rare butterfly, the caterpillars generally feed at night, so you don't see them during the day. And eventually we get um, adult butterflies. And it's, it's a really, really um, wonderful and fulfilling moment to get an entire cage full of adults of a rare butterfly that you're going to be taking out to uh, a new spot and starting a new population of this rare butterfly and, and uh, hoping to increase its numbers and its chances of long-term survival here in Northeastern Illinois. Finally, oh yes, we, um, we also in general have to carry things over the winter. And so this is our environmental chamber where we are um, carrying caterpillars, uh, in this case of the regal fritillary, I believe, uh, over the winter. And we will take them out in the spring, warm them up, and start them feeding again. And that, that is how we can deal with that aspect of the butterfly's biology as we are raising it in the lab. Final thing I want to mention is the butterfly monitoring network. This is something you can actually help the butterfly conservation in Illinois by becoming a butterfly monitor. And what happens is you get assigned to a place and you get given a map with a walking trail on that place. And six times a year, you go out and you walk your survey route and you count and identify all of the butterflies you see within 20 feet of you while you're walking. We teach you how to do it. We teach you how to identify the butterflies. It's a lot of fun. If you want to get involved, our website is www.bfly.org. And that is where you can get the process starting. Thank you very much.